Well, let me start by saying thank you so much for being patient with me. Uh, I've been gone for two weeks, and the fact that you let me do that is, is a blessing for sure. I got to go and preach a meeting in Athens right before the week of camp, and I don't think I'll ever do that again. Um, that's a whole new kind of tired. I don't even think they have a word for that, but um, nonetheless, I'm, I'm thankful that I got to go and do that, and I'm thankful for you and for what we do here in this place. I want to remind everybody also, as a side note, speaking of camp, is that there'll be a singing tonight up at the new campground at the River Hills Retreat at 7.30. Um, it's, you can pull it up on maps or whatever uh, app you use for that, and it'll take you right to it. But if you don't know, if you go to the Hayden exit, turn right on 160, it's up at the old, uh, old plantation golf course. And so... Um, it's supposed to be a little better than it was last year. Last year they didn't have the AC quite figured out in that room, and they do now, and so should be more comfortable this year. And it'll give you a chance to see what it is that we're investing in up there. Uh, the legalities of all that are, are finally almost in place where we can actually welcome investors to take part in, in, uh, in what we hope to accomplish up there in giving not only our kids a place to have camp that will allow us more funds to go to scholarships uh, for Florida College, but also... Uh, we can do other things with that space. It's, it's, it's truly a beautiful, beautiful spot, and I hope you'll come tonight. But today we're going to talk about dads. The custom of the American church has been to celebrate and honor our mothers on Mother's Day with a sermon from the text that truly expounds and illuminates on the good things that godly mothers are and should be. And I, to be honest, I think we should do that. Mothers have one of the most important jobs, incredible responsibility, um, and one of the most incredible responsibilities we have in the world that should be recognized for their fruits, for their contributions according to the Bible and what it teaches regarding mothers. But the custom for Father's Day is a little different. While we usually build up the women of the congregation on Mother's Day, we usually just tear down the men. Tear you to shreds and tell you what you're not doing right. And men, we are usually okay with that, right? That's kind of how we communicate to one another. Because we're supposed to be tough, right? Aren't we? Isn't that the language that we speak and understand? Well, I'm not going to do that today. Today I want to encourage our fathers because being one myself, I know every now and again I could use it. And I think today would be a good day that we all could enjoy a little bit of that. A kind word, softly spoken, maybe an affirmation. Because like all things, balance is key. It was Henry David Thoreau that said this about men. He said, the mass of men live in quiet desperation. What is called resignation is confirmed desperation, he goes on to say. From the desperate city, you go into the desperate country and have to console yourself with the bravery of minks and muskrats. A stereotyped but unconscious despair is concealed even under what are called the games and amusements of mankind. There is no play in them, for there this comes after the work. But it is a characteristic of wisdom not to do desperate things. That Henry David Thoreau is a smart fellow. And what he is stating here is that as men, we are trained from a young age to be strong. We're trained from a young age to be tough, to be brave, to protect, provide, even if it means our death. And Paul says in Ephesians 5, to love our wives as Christ loved the church, and meaning that we should... Die in their place, if that's what's necessary. And Paul is right. As men, we, like women, have a role to fulfill. And what that should cost us is everything, if that's what it takes. And if we're doing it with passion, according to the scripture, that's what it should look like. That when we are working to provide for our families and bearing the weight also 
of the spiritual integrity of our homes as well as the financial means of our homes, that we are simultaneously also fighting off the temptations to sin and give in to worldliness and lust. We all know that is man's. And when I say man, I mean men. That is our biggest issue. And it's so important to have a soft place to land when we go home. And when it comes to our children, we're not only feeding their bellies, but we're feeding their minds with the wisdom of God. I hope we are. Not just protecting them from evil people, but protecting their souls from the evil one. And not just making memories with them, with the time that we give them, but completing them with the pieces of ourselves that we freely give. And so, dads, this is for you. It's for me too. I needed this as much as anybody in this room. Because it is a quiet desperation sometimes that we live in. It's a hard job. And it's often heavy to carry. And just under the surface of this, sometimes quiet and, and stone-faced man as a human being, just like everyone else, we fear, we worry, we wonder, we contemplate, we get anxious, just like everybody else does. We just don't show you, or we try not to. We wonder sometimes if we're really strong enough to do the job that's been assigned to us and not fail. There's a fear I think that all men have that I would rather see my family see me die than fail. And maybe that sits under the skin of every man, but I know that it does for me. But we push all that aside because we know that that's the only option. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 12 that when we are weak, then we are strong. And so just for a few minutes, I want to remind the fathers here today that where our strength is and where our courage comes from is from God of heaven. And to know that with God, it's unlimited strength. It's undeniable courage and unspeakable love that doesn't always manifest in our words, ladies, and we're sorry about that. But hopefully you see in our actions that when we get up and leave the house when it's still dark, we do that because we love you. And we come home and our bodies are just done. It's because we offer them as a sacrifice to provide. And that maybe we don't express it enough in our words, but you'll see that in our actions. And that you'll know that you're loved. These are the pieces that we give. We give away ourselves every day so that our families can have. These are the true gifts, however, of fatherhood. It's not what we receive, but it's what we give. I, I think I speak for, for most dads in this room. We garner so much more gratification in giving and seeing you receive something than we do actually getting something. I don't know about all the dads in here, but I don't receive gifts very well. It's always kind of this awkward exchange where I don't really feel deserving to receive anything. And I, and I try to express gratitude, but it's kind of awkward. And to my family, I'm sorry about that. But the first gift, the first piece of anything that we should give will be giving our kids as fathers the love that we've been shown. Open your Bibles to, it's supposed to be 1 John that's what happens when you're tired and you put together your slides. It's supposed to be 1 John 4. But love has to be the first thing that we give our families because it is the first thing that God gave us. We see this mirrored in this passage. He says, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. And whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And so we have come to know and to believe that the love of God that God has for us, that God is love, 
And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love, and we love because he first loved us. You see this model created first by God. This is that creational grace that I, that I, that I love so much. That before there was a sinner, there was a savior. That before there was, there was a gospel to obey, love was shown. Love was given. And then when we fell, being tempted by Satan in the garden to sin, God provided love once more by sending his son. And what we see here is that love completes the child. That phrase there, by this love perfected with us, means to be completed. That from heaven God sent his love to us and that when we receive it, we send it back in obedience and it completes the cycle of love. It's perfected because it's completed. It's reached its intended goal with us and we've received it and returned it. And so when fathers love their children, it completes the child. It creates confidence in the child. There is something that you just can't put a price on. When you see a child that knows that they are loved, they don't worry, they don't question, they don't have doubts, they know they're loved, and you see this confidence built into their selves. Because at the end of the day, they know that their father loves them. It teaches the child not to fear. Terror. It teaches the child not to fear their father, but to respect him. And honor him. It completes the model for the child to then become the model also for their children. You see, this cycle began with God to us, and we perpetuate the cycle as he gave us the ability to create our own people. And so this model that was given where God first loved us, we also first love our children. And it completes these things. It is the first thing we give to even create them when they're created out of an act of love. And it will be the last thing that we give them to complete them as they become fathers and mothers themselves. And after love, we have to give them leadership. With love given at first, a trust between fathers and their children is then established. And then that creates a perfect condition for leadership and the dynamic of leadership to take place as the Bible prescribes to us. Without trust, may, listen, write it down. Without trust, there is no leadership. If the people that you think you're leading don't trust you, you're just taking a walk because nobody's following you. Trust comes shown first through love. Now you have established the right to be a leader. Understand this, men. God gave us a role to be leaders in our families. But because it's God-given doesn't mean that you don't have to earn it. Don't let any moron be a dad. There ought to be a test you have to take because sometimes they fail. The majority of atheists in the world are atheists because their dads failed, and the majority of those are men. How could there be an all-powerful, all-loving Heavenly Father that you can follow when my earthly example has failed so far and fell so far from the example? Leadership, God-given, but earned. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. 
Without trust, no leadership will take place. And a leader can only lead those who are willing to be led. And if trust is the engine that ignites leadership, then love is its fuel. And this is why Paul tells fathers in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, he says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And that is not Ephesians. That is tired. That is camp tired talking. But provoke here means, by the Greek definition, unreasonable, merciless, needless, and a manifestation of anger. The apostle here has hit the very danger to which parents are most exposed in raising their children. It is that sourcing of their temper, making them feel that the parent is under the influence of anger, and it's not right for them to be so too. Leading with a fist is not leading. Listen to me. Leading with a fist is not leading, it's bullying. And far too many fathers are bullies and not worthy of the role of leader. There is no quicker way to lose the trust and the confidence than to bully your children or to bully their mother in front of them. So govern them. Govern them. Lead them. And punish them if punishment is necessary. But punish and bully are not the same word. Punish them so that they will not lose their confidence in you, but they shall love you and thank you for it. The second part of this verse is translated in other translations as the nurturing and admonition of the Lord. I think sometimes we fail to see that. Nurturing. Dads. Nurture means to bring up well, to feed, to nourish. Fathers, when we feed our children a steady diet of God's word, coupled with the example that matches the words that we're saying, there is no doubt we will bring them up well. And they will be nourished. They will be fed. And they will follow our leadership by the pieces of ourselves that we leave for them to follow. When we begin with the love that cultivates leadership, then illuminating their steps then sets the stage for the rest of their lives. You see, we also have to provide the light. If we love them first and gain their trust to lead them, we have to show them where they're going. In Psalm 119 and 105, David says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn an oath. And confirmed it to keep your righteous rules. I'm severely afflicted. Give me life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept my free will offerings of praise, O Lord. Teach me your rules. I hold my life in my hand continually, but I do not forget your law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, but I do not stray from your precepts. Your testimonies are my heritage forever. And they are a joy to my heart. I incline my heart to perform your statutes forever. To the end, understanding that the basis of the beginning for all things demanded in the role of fatherhood begins in the word and its ability to illuminate our steps. If we want to guide our children, we first have to walk the walk. We have to walk in these steps. We have to see this path. We are ground zero for teaching our children the truth about God. The world is going to do its best to lead them in its direction. And whether you think so or not, dads, you are still the most influential person in your kid's life. Now, where and how you influence them will be completely up to you, but God gives us some direction here. To illuminate their steps, We first have to be willing to keep our commitments. In spite of trials, in spite of struggles, acknowledging God and his power over all things keeps the joy of his love in our hearts. It says here, 
It'll do that. Your testimonies are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. I incline my heart to perform your statutes forever to the end. And so, fathers, I want to encourage us all to spend a little more time in the Word. I know I'm a preacher, and you hear that all the time, and I probably harp on it, but guess what? I'm going to harp a little more because it's that important. Spend a little more time in God's Word. Let Him shape and mold your heart so you can shape and mold theirs. The investment will guarantee dividends in the long run. Make no mistake. Because the more we know God and His purpose for us, the more we also can know about how to accomplish that purpose. And if we live, as Henry David Thoreau said, lives of quiet desperation, as I know many of us do, oftentimes it is because we don't know what our next move is. But he does. God does know what our next move is. And we sometimes forget that before he called us to be leaders, he first called us to be followers. From the scripture reading, Deuteronomy 28, verse 1 through 6. If you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments that I command you today, the Lord God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city and blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground and the fruit of your cattle and increase of the herds and the young of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in and blessed shall you be when you go out. You see, if we leave our kids pieces of us, if we give them the gifts of being a father, if that's what we hope to do, we first have to be filled with the right pieces. Because here's the thing, you're going to leave your kids pieces for you no matter what they are. What kind of pieces do you want to leave them? Do you want to leave them the pieces of your struggles? Do you want to leave them the pieces of your failings? Do you want to leave them the pieces of your anger, your temper, your lack of self-control, your unwillingness to do what's necessary, all the, the things that, 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 that life can bring into our lives? Are those the pieces we want to leave our kids? Or we do want to leave them these. Do we want to leave them love and leadership and life. I hope I know the answer to that. But the point has to be made because we live in a world that doesn't honor these things. Where men are constantly downplayed and looked at as second class anymore. It would seem to me the worst thing you can be in America right now is a straight Christian dad. But the truth is, is that this country needs you, and it needs more of you. But it doesn't need you angry. It needs you righteous. It doesn't need you violent. It needs you holy. And your kids need that too. Our kids need that too. These are the true gifts of fatherhood. And so I want to leave you with one of my favorite songs from the last several years. I quoted this song a couple of years ago in a Lord's, not a Lord's Supper sermon, but a Father's Day sermon. And in, it is one of those songs that has stayed with me, especially this time of year. In 2010, the Christian band Sanctus Real released this song about this very thing, about the pieces of us that we can leave as fathers, the gifts of fatherhood, the blessings of being a dad. And the author of the song captures this idea perfectly. He says, I look around, I see my wonderful life, almost perfect from the outside. In picture frames, I see my beautiful wife, always smiling, 
But on the inside, I can hear her saying, lead me with strong hands. Stand up when I can't. Don't leave me hungry for love, chasing dreams, but what about us? Show me that you're willing to fight, that I'm still the love of your life. I know we call this our home, but I still feel so alone. I see their faces, look in their innocent eyes. They're just children from the outside. I'm working hard, I tell myself. They'll be fine. They're independent. But on the inside, I can hear them saying, lead me with strong hands. Stand up when I can't. Don't leave me hungry for love, chasing your dreams, but what about us? Show me that you're willing to fight, that I'm still the love of your life. I know we call this our home, but we still feel alone. So, Father, give me the strength to be everything I'm called to be. Father, show me the way to lead them. Won't you lead me? To lead them with strong hands, to stand up when they can't. Don't want to leave them hungry for love, chasing things that I could give up. I'll show them that I'm willing to fight and give them the best of my life so we can call this a home. Lead me, Father, because I can't do this alone. And none of us can. None of us can. This song speaks volumes of what I believe are the hopes of every father here. And when my life is over, hopefully we will have given them the best pieces of us, the best gifts, the best blessings, the pieces that learn life's hardest lessons so that they won't have to, the gifts that left scars on me that taught you valuable lessons from the stories that I share, the blessings that exposed us as vulnerable whenever we were moved to tears by something that, that our kids said or did. The pieces that taught us it was okay for a man to cry. That being strong wasn't about being tough, but also tender. The gifts that taught us to teach our children that mercy always, always, always triumphs judgment. The pieces that taught us to put God first. The blessings that assured us that we assured our kids that they were loved completely by us and that we were proud of them. I've come to learn in this life that these gifts of fatherhood, these blessings, these pieces of us, at the end of the day, dads, it's all we really have to offer, isn't it? And it's been my life's greatest journey to be my kid's dad. And I know that it has for you too. And I hope that for all the dads here, speaking to all the families, that we leave you better because of the pieces that we gave you. And so I haven't said anything about becoming a Christian because I think everyone who is one, is one here. But I want you to understand something. The greatest lesson as fathers that we'll ever teach our kids is submission to the Lord. If you want to leave your kids better, lead them to Christ. And so if you're here this morning and you're subject to that, I beg you let it be known as we sing a song to encourage you.